Here's where we left off. We were talking about what happens if the glomerular filtration rate is not normal. We were talking about GFR abnormalities. If the GFR is not normal, if it's too high, we can end up becoming dehydrated because we're losing too much fluid in urine. And we can also end up with an abnormal ratio of sodium and potassium and calcium. If it's too low, then waste don't get efficiently excreted. When someone's blood pressure is low because of blood loss or dehydration, they get this buildup of nitrogenous waste that's called azotemia, and it can progress to uremia. So how does the body regulate the GFR? How do we keep it in that sweet spot? And the answers are autoregulation, which I've already alluded to by talking about the juxtaglomerular cells, and then also by hormones. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus, where should I put me? Okay, I'll put me over there. The juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now the juxtaglomerular apparatus has got three parts. The juxtaglomerular cells, interesting cells. These are cells that are smooth muscle cells, but they also are mechanoreceptors, so they know what the blood pressure is, and uh, they also are endocrine cells. They release a hormone. Crazy, right? All of that in one set of cells. So the juxtaglomerular cells are there. If your blood pressure, keep in mind that your body wants the pressure inside of here to be right in the sweet spot so that the right amount of fluid leaves, right? Now, the diameter of the efferent arterial also can be adjusted, but the juxtaglomerular cells are more avidly regulating the size of the afferent arterial. If your blood pressure is too high, pressure in here will be too high. So the juxtaglomerular cells sense, ooh, blood pressure is too high. They constrict the arteriole so that pressure in here goes down into the sweet spot again and the reverse, all right? What about the mesangial cells? Mesangial cells are a little bit baffling. However, for those of you who end up in um, medicine for geriatric patients or kidney failure patients, these mesangial cells are an important part of kidney failure. There are things that happen to the kidney with high blood pressure or type 2 diabetes that specifically trick the mesangial cells into creating scar tissue there in the uh, glomerulus itself. So they end up being very important, but we won't talk about them more in uh, 151. The macula densa cells. The macula densa cells are right here. Where are they? Are they in the distal convoluted tubule or in the ascending limb of the nephron loop? Okay, pretty much the reason why people argue about that is that those two areas are really close together. Um, but uh, this is busy measuring how hypertonic the fluid in here is. If the fluid in here is very salty, then these cells can inhibit the juxtaglomerular cells from releasing renin. So the macula densa cells are, I usually think of it this way. I think of how the filtrate starts here, it goes through the proximal convoluted tubule, nephron loop, then when it gets here to the distal convoluted tubule, it's almost done. So this is kind of like a quality control touchback mechanism where the body can say, okay, how are we doing? We're almost done. How are we doing so far? Okay. So uh, myogenic mechanism, the myogenic mechanism isn't anything fancy. It's just what I was saying, that if the blood pressure is too high, they constrict bringing it back down into normal. Now, this way of the juxtaglomerular cells measuring your blood pressure and compensating for it is only uh, functional with a blood pressure range of 80 to 170 systolic. When a patient's systolic blood pressure keeps dipping below 80 beats per minute, then this system cannot maintain an adequate glomerular filtration rate. We usually know when that's happening, but a very dehydrated or very shocky patient, it can get below that. 
When the blood pressure goes above 170 millimeters per mercury systolic, and this is actually quite common, then this system also cannot compensate for that. Now, people with high blood pressure hardly in, ever end up hospitalized because they're making too much urine. That can happen. That's not usually the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that when a patient's systolic blood pressure goes above 170 millimeters of mercury, the pressure in here gets to be too high. And when it gets to be 180, 190, that will start to rupture or pop this capillary bed and damage the capillary bed. And when the capillary get, bed gets damaged by high blood pressure, what does that do? Let's go back and look at the filtration membrane for a moment so we can talk about that in more detail. Okay. So here's our filtration membrane. We have got all of this detail, all of this detail, right? Now, let's just imagine that this part of the glomerulus, ooh, it was under too much pressure, it popped, right? If it popped, there will be blood going out here, there will be a blood clot that forms, and this area, it will heal. But it won't look like that after it heals. After it heals, there will be a little area of scar, right? And that's not a big deal. If you've got a little area of scar tissue here, yeah, you've got plenty of filtration membrane. But then that area pops, little area scar. Then that area pops, a little bit more scar. When someone has high blood pressure, then it doesn't happen catastrophically all at once. But at every given hour of every day, a few of their nephrons are popping and then they're healing with scar tissue. Now, it pops in its heels, so probably someone with high blood pressure would go, well, why should I care? Yeah, but when it heals, it heals with scar tissue. So that's kind of like you're meant to have a spaghetti strainer, but periodically an area gets damaged and you just patch it with a little piece of aluminum foil, but you keep using it. And then another area, you patch it and you patch it and patch it. If you keep patching the inside of your spaghetti strainer with aluminum foil, at a certain point, you just end up with a bowl. It's not a strainer at all. And that's what happens here with high blood pressure and the glomerulus. It's meant to have fluid go out and then the water filters out and then only a little bit of blood goes back. But at a certain point, blood just goes in and blood goes out and no filtrate would get formed at that glomerular uh, capillary bed at all. And in that case, it's not just the glomerulus, that's been taken offline, that entire nephron is no longer helping you make a urine and purify your blood, right? So that's how high, one of the ways that high blood pressure ends up damaging your kidneys. It just blows out little areas, one after another after another. All righty. So I'm just gonna remind you of our little analogy for cleaning out the closet. And our analogy for cleaning out the closet is at the beginning, everything goes out. Well, everything. The red blood cells don't leave, the platelets don't leave, the white blood cells don't leave, the big proteins, fibrinogen, albumin, they don't leave. Oh, if you're working on your study guide, that means the things that are not in filtrate are red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, albumin, fibrinogen, other large proteins, they are not out in the filtrate. However, what is in healthy filtrate, when you're healthy, when you're normal, what is in the filtrate? Glucose, amino acids, water-soluble vitamins, those are in filtrate, tons of water, lots of water, and salts are in filtrate, and urea infiltrate. Oh, hydrogen ions and carboxide ions. They're all infiltrate, right? So now we come to this part. Oh, now I'll hide over in the lower right corner. Now we're in this part. We're going to be talking about reabsorption and secretion. It's very often called tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Where does tubular reabsorption happen? Well, in the tubules. Proximal convoluted tubule, nephron loop, distal convoluted tubule. Where does tubular secretion happen? 
same places, all right? Now, that I do not mean to imply that what happens in the proximal convoluted tubule is the same as what happens in those other two areas, all right? All three of them is, are distinct, and we're going to talk about them one at a time and for reasons that make sense from one point of view, they're a little bit out of order, right? But first, let's remember reabsorption. Reabsorption is there's all of this stuff there in the filtrate, including a lot of the stuff that the body does not want to leave in the urine. I don't want my glucose to leave. So the cells of the simple cuboidal epithelium are going to grab those from that filtrate, put them back into the bloodstream, all right? Tubular secretion. There are some things that they're still in the blood there at the peritubular capillary. And we're thinking, man, I kind of wish I would have thrown that away. It's not too late. The simple cuboidal epithelial cells there at the tubules can grab things from the peritubular capillaries and throw them into the already formed filtrate. And that is called tubular secretion. All right. So here, sorry. Here we are at the peritubular capillary. And let's talk about something that I'm tremendously enthusiastic about. I don't think I ever managed to convey the coolness of it, but let me try it again. Do you remember when we were talking about the way fluid leaves the capillaries at the beginning of a typical capillary bed because hydrostatic pressure is greater than osmotic pressure, and then it returns into a typical capillary at the end of the capillary bed, because at the end, hydrostatic pressure has fallen, so osmotic pressure now is higher than hydrostatic pressure, right? Well, you can sort of imagine the development of the human body as at some point, the body said, hey, that whole capillary hydrostatic osmotic pressure thing, that's really a cute trick. I think I can use that. And here is how that system that we learned earlier kind of just barely gets tweaked to do something really, I think, remarkable. So what the kidney has done in its organization of blood vessel and tubules is the kidney has separated out that first part of the system where um, hydrostatic pressure was greater than osmotic pressure, so fluid left, it has separated that out from the second part. Now the first part, where hydrostatic pressure is very high, much higher than osmotic pressure, so fluid leaves, that's happening here in the renal corpuscle. And there's an extra little twist that now that water that leaves, it leaves more readily because the glomerulus is extra leaky and has higher blood pressure inside of it than a typical capillary bed. There's also a second twist, that the fluid that leaves, it doesn't just slop, splash across cells, it actually gets captured in this um, Bowman's capsule and sent down a tube, right? But that's what's happening there. The hydrostatic pressure is unusually high the filtration membrane is unusually leaky, and so lots of fluid leaks at the beginning at this capillary bed. Now, the blood that's left behind is going to go into the efferent arteriole and go here into the paratubular capillaries. The paratubular capillaries are actually another capillary bed. It's, it's not like the way this schematic is drawn. And because there's a second capillary bed, then technically this is a portal system. And also because this is a second capillary bed, blood pressure here in the paratubular capillaries is unusually low. So in the paratubular capillaries, the blood hydrostatic pressure is very low and its osmotic pressure called the colloid osmotic pressure is unusually high. Now, why is the colloid osmotic pressure so high? Because at the beginning here, a lot of water some solute too, but a lot of water was asked to leave. So that means that the solutes that are left behind inside of all those cells and all of those proteins, they are extra concentrated here at the paratubular capillary. 
So the kidney has organized it so that at the beginning, hydrostatic pressure is even higher than normal. And at the end, colloid osmotic pressure is even higher than normal. And osmotic pressure, I'm sorry, and hydrostatic pressure is even lower than normal. So here's what happens. Right here in the paratubular capillaries, almost two thirds of the water that left comes right back into the paratubular capillaries, right away, right there at the proximal convoluted tubular, boom. And you might think, well, that's really dumb. All the water left and now it comes right back in. Like, okay, but here's the thing. The water that left, left through little tiny holes. So you can think of the water that left as dirty water. The water that comes back into the paratubular capillary is not crossing through any little holes. It has to go directly either through cells or through the little tiny spaces between cells. So the water that comes back is not dirty water. The water that comes back is clean water. And all of that happened just because of that stuff you memorized for the cardiovascular system. All right, we'll pick up at the next slide. We'll pick up at the next slide at the beginning of the next video.